Belize Zombie Fiction by Graham Downs First published 30 October 2014 One That's my creation down there, do you see? Shambling along the empty suburban street in the middle of the night past the parked car to its left to its right a dog lies on his back he rolls over onto his feet hackles raised and barks as he sees the creature the creature turns its grotesque countenance towards the animal and glares at him the poor thing cowers as his brave bark becomes a pathetic whimper look now it's standing under a lonely street light. Through this crystal ball you can truly appreciate its beauty, with its clothes tattered and muddy, and the grave worm still crawling in and out of its empty eye sockets. My creation. When I went to the cemetery last night with an old copy of contemporary necromancy under my arm, I could never have imagined that the ritual would be such a success. I stood at the grave of old Jacob Malady, 1955-2012, to thumbed open the book and eagerly paged to the spell on raising zombies. I'm not sure how well I expected the spell to work, if at all, but as I read the incantation out loud, the hairs on my arms and the nape of my neck stood on end, and I felt power. As the power rose in me, the dirt covering the corpse's grave began to shift. Slowly it shifted, so slowly I thought it might just be the wind, or my imagination. Then the turf broke, and a hand slipped through, a glorious, wonderful hand, the skin on the long, slender fingers all wrinkled, ripped in places so that the bones shone through, almost glinting in the moonlight my creation. My name is Billy McIntyre, and that is no longer Jacob Melody down there. I am a necromancer, and they will all pay for calling me a freak. At the cul-de-sac in the distance, the zombie spies a house with some activity inside. The lights are on, the only house on the street with lights on at this hour. An old couple lives there, Mr. and Mrs. Kretcher. I think they must be watching television. I've seen the way they look at me sometimes. I've heard the mutterings about me under their breaths. The spell book said that the creature needed to eat human flesh to survive. The Kretchers shall be its first meal. As the creature lumbers towards the light, I begin to make out the sounds of a television in the distance. I was right. But there's something more. I hear shouting, and it's not coming from the television. The couple are having an argument. I urge the creature closer so that I can hear more. Something about an old girlfriend. Her name is Melanie, I think. Yes, Mrs. Kretcher is berating her husband because he spoke to her on the phone earlier today. Mr. Kretcher can't understand why the two of them shouldn't be friends. He makes for the door and slams it open, storming out. The zombie is really close now, and the door opens just as the creature is making ready to smash it down with its superhuman strength. I spur the shell of the late Mr. Malady on. It smashes into Mr. Kretcher, its arms, hands and fingers outstretched. The creature's thumbs press simultaneously into Mr. Kretcher's eyeballs. I hear them pop, and I can almost feel the jelly as it oozes out onto the zombie's hands. Mr. Kretcher screams, but his scream is cut short as the zombie's thumbs press deeper into his ocular cavities, through his skull, and into his brain. What strength my creature has! Mrs. Kretcher shrieks, as she enters the passageway between the open door and the lounge. The zombie tosses Mr. Kretcher's body aside and lunges for her. With one fell swoop, 
it smashes its hand into the side of Mrs. Cretch's head and crushes it against the wall. The house is silent now, except for the low drone of the television. Go on, my creation. Bring the man's body inside. That's it. Shut the door now. We don't want any interruptions, do we? And now, my glorious monster, you may feast. Two. Billy, pay attention. Billy McIntyre snapped his head up and stared at Miss Coleman, his grade 8 maths teacher. Huh? I mean, yes, Mrs. Coleman? I asked you a question, said Miss Coleman, as she glared at the boy. Now, would you please explain Pythagoras' theorem to the class? Billy answered by rote memorization. In a right angle triangle, the area of a square on the hypotenuse is equal to the sum of the areas of the squares of the other two sides. Very good, Billy, answered Miss Coleman, a little irritated at this know-it-all child. So, who can tell me the definition of hypotenuse? A couple of hands shot up, including Sarah, sitting opposite Billy. Billy glared at her and Sarah looked at him and stuck out her tongue. There was no love lost between Billy and Sarah. Living two blocks down from him, at least she didn't call him a freak like just about everyone else in the neighborhood. She was a bit of a freak herself, but she disliked Billy just the same. Sarah was raised to believe in the basic good of people, and she did a pretty good job of living out her upbringing except when it came to Billy. There was something about him that rubbed young Sarah up the wrong way, and the feeling was mutual. Billy looked around the class at the other kids. Miss Coleman wasn't particularly good at holding her students' attentions. They were sniggering amongst themselves, or folding paper aeroplanes, or tossing crumpled up love letters to each other. He glanced over at Sarah again, Miss Coleman was exclaiming what a clever girl she was, and Sarah was lapping her praise up like a puppy dog. Something about Sarah gave Billy the creeps. Well, he thought, maybe I'll let my zombie feast on her tonight. Three. I probably shouldn't have left the zombie at the crutches last night. I was tired and the creature was hungry. Look at him now, crouched over the remains of Mrs. Cretcher, tearing a piece of already decomposing flesh off the corpse's thigh. But where is Mr. Cretcher? Ah, yes, now I see. My creation works fast. There is nothing left of the poor man but bones. Every last bit of flesh has been removed. What's that noise? It sounds like Mrs. Cretcher. It cannot be. Stand up, zombie, and to the window. You know I can only see you and what you can see. That's right, shamble over there. Let's have a look. But it is. Am I dreaming? The recently deceased creatures walking hand in hand up the path to their front door. But there they are, on the floor in the house, where my creature left them. Can they be ghosts? No matter. It killed them once, it can kill them again. They're getting closer, zombie. Quick, hide behind the door. There, I can hear them jabbering away to each other. I hear keys being shaken as Mrs. Cretcher searches for the right one. It's in the door now. Steady, zombie, steady. The key turns in the lock, and the door opens. The creature lunges for Mrs. Cretcher. What's this? He goes right through her. And Mr. Cretcher following closely behind. He walks straight through the creature, as though it isn't even there. They cannot see him nor feel him, as they continue to talk to each other while walking through the entrance hall. They cannot see their own corpses either, lying motionless on the floor, as they walk straight through them. Try again, creature. I really must think of a name for you. While his back is turned, attack! 
The creature lifts its arm and brings it down hard over the top of Mr. Kretcher's head, attempting to send him crashing to the floor. Its arm moves through his head, as if it were nothing but air. A blinding light fills the room, and for an instant I cannot see anything except an overwhelming yellow glare. Make it stop, I cry, as it burns my eyes. As the worst of the light begins to dissipate, I turn the zombie's head, and it sees a form beginning to take shape. Yes, it's definitely a human form, but I cannot tell whether male or female, nor any distinguishing features. It seems to be a creature of pure light. Gazing upon it is uncomfortable but not as unbearable as the blinding yellow hue was when it first arrived. A voice comes into my head. It's vaguely familiar, but I cannot place it. What? A dream? They're dreaming? What is this rubbish that you speak? She, yes, I can tell that the voice is female now, is saying that she rewound time for them. She says that they didn't die last night, and that they're dreaming now. They are feeling uneasy, she says, but they do not know why, because they cannot see my creature, nor can they see their own corpses on the ground, nor can they see this being of light that she now speaks to me through. I must fight this, this abomination that offends me so. Creature, attack! The creature turns and lunges for the vaguely humanoid-shaped light, but steps through it. My zombie appears on the other side, with little flames burning on the tips of its fingers. The voice speaks in my head again. You cannot win, Billy. How does this woman, girl, whatever she is, know who I am? Surely this being that she controls cannot see me. The light creature turns towards my zombie, casually and deliberately placing its hand on the animated corpse's back. No! I scream. The creature is all at once engulfed in flame, and then just as quickly it is gone. My creature is finished, and what's this? My crystal ball, my beautiful crystal ball, is shattered into pieces before my very eyes. Four. Billy McIntyre screamed as the crystal ball he was gazing through shattered into pieces. His hands went up to his eyes to shield them, and as he removed his hands, he saw blood. At least he could still see, but the stinging above his eyebrows told him that the glass from the ball had cut into his forehead. Hello, Billy. Billy spun around with a look of complete horror on his face. Standing behind him was Sarah, the little girl from his maths class, the one whom he hated so much. His jaw dropped open as he lifted his hand and pointed a shaky finger at her. Sarah, how on earth? What did you do? Where is my wonderful creature? Sarah held up her hand to stop him from talking, then replied in a calm, motherly voice that seemed far beyond her years. I know what you've been up to, Billy, tinkering with necromancy, defiling poor old Mr. Malady, and killing that wonderful old couple, the Cretches. I couldn't let it go on any longer. That wonderful couple hated me, spat Billy, momentarily forgetting his confusion as to how Sarah could be there in the first place just like everybody else in this stupid town, just like you. And Mr. Malady was no different. It's only fitting that he should be my instrument of revenge. Nobody hates you, Billy, replied Sarah softly, as she slowly stepped forward to place a cupped hand on Billy's cheek. You're just misunderstood. People fear what they don't understand. Maybe if you were a little more forthcoming about yourself to people, or if you took the time to actually talk to them. Tell them about your mother. You know nothing about my mother, 
Billy fumed as he backed away from Sarah. My mother has been dead two years, and nobody has ever bothered to ask how I'm doing. My father wants nothing to do with me. He hates me, just like the rest of you. Don't you ever talk about my parents again. Sarah gasped, and just then Billy remembered where he was and where Sarah was. Seizing the opportunity, he added, And where the hell did you come from, anyway? What happened to my ball, and what was that being of light down there? Oh, Billy, I told you that I could not allow you to continue on this path of destruction. I was there, watching you, when you took a copy of Contemporary Necromancy out of the library. You didn't see me, but I was there. My spirit followed you to the cemetery, and I saw you use the book to raise poor Mr. Malady's corpse from the grave. But how? interrupted Billy. I am a spirit walker, Billy, continued Sarah. I can go anywhere I want, and I can be completely invisible, or I can manifest as either myself or the being of light that you witnessed at the crutches. Yes, that was me too. But you rewound time? Yes, in situations of grave importance, I can do that too, Billy. I just couldn't allow those two innocent people to die so cruelly. And now, Billy, I need to stop you. Billy saw a red haze as the anger boiled up inside him. Stop him? Nobody was going to stop him from enacting his vengeance against the world. Least of all this puny girl. He screamed as he lunged towards Sarah. He grabbed her arms, pinning them against her sides, and he began to shake her. Her eyes rolled back in her head and she became limp. All at once, Billy felt a searing pain in his hands. He screamed in agony and stepped back. Sarah fell to the ground like a sack. As Billy glanced down at his hands, they were on fire. Flames were dancing off his fingers and his palms, consuming the flesh as the pain he was feeling became unbearable. He screamed once more as the flames grew bigger and multiplied, first onto his arms and then onto his shoulders and then onto his chest. He tried to scream again, but inhaled the intense heat radiating from the flames in his chest. They seared his esophagus and burnt through his lungs. And then the flames disappeared. The heat subsided. Sarah slowly began to move. She carefully pushed herself up onto her knees and finally stood up on her feet. Looking down at the wretched, charred remains of Billy McIntyre, she said to herself, Oh dear Billy, why did it have to be this way? I could have saved you. We could have done so much together. What a waste of your precious life. For more of Graham Downs's writing, visit his website at www.grahamdowns.co.za.